I just couldn't control the obsession. That's what it was. It was an obsession. I could do it for a little while. Mm-hmm. And I and I had five years in AA at one time. I had three years, I had two years. Um, so it was always the alcohol deprivation that would get me. And I would go back and I would go back. Welcome everybody. My name is Katie Lane with Thrive Alcohol Recovery. And today I am really excited to be chatting with Brenda, who is, she's many things. She's a Sinclair Method success story. Um, She's become a real friend of mine, I would say over the last several years. I've known you, I think for at least a couple of years now since you started TSM. Um, You're also serving as a coach and a source of support inside Thrive. And Um, I know you also started coaching um, on your own on the C3 Foundation as well. So I'm really excited to have you here, Brenda, because I know a bit about your Sinclair Method success story. And it wasn't the perfect TSM journey by any means. And you have quite a long history of challenges with alcohol. So I feel like we have a lot to talk about and dive into on this call and things that will really help people um, wherever they're at on TSM, but particularly if someone is struggling or feeling impatient or frustrated with their TSM journey, because I know you have been there as well. So just wanted to start by thanking you for taking time to chat with me today. Oh my gosh, the pleasure is all mine. Yay. Well, I'm looking forward to this. So I wondered if we could just kick things off from the beginning. Can you tell us a little bit about your history with alcohol use and, you know, how it is that it kind of got to be out of control and ultimately, you know, led you to the Sinclair method? Yeah. Um, Boy, I'm tempted to go back in time here. I, I feel like I have lived three or there's been three segments of my life, three stages, if you will, um, 15 to 22 ish around there. Uh, you know, alcohol was a fun thing. Um, partying, being a, a typical teenager. Uh, thank God I didn't, you know, there could have been worse things that had happened during all that time of drinking and partying and I grew up in the county where uh, we rode around and raced cars. It was the 80s. I mean, it was just a fun time. And I survived that, which is which was great. <laughs> I got through it. Uh, just the typical stuff of, you know, getting in trouble by the cops, go home, that kind of thing. There was a lot of red flags looking back now. Um, like, wow, I'm, I'm really lucky it was the 80s and there wasn't an internet and there wasn't all that stuff because, man there would have been stories to have been told and been on the, been around. So it was kind of like that stage. Um, And then from like 22 ish, 23, uh, maybe up to 28, 30 ish was a different time. And that's when uh, my first treatment, I went inpatient treatment when I was, I think 29, 30. Um, And that I I'd had my child, he was, Oh, I don't know, five or six at the time. And so it was time to get serious. Like during my pregnancy, I didn't drink. And so I was able to rein it in and I could stop and go. And, um, you know, I'd have the one off night of drinking really heavy, being hungover. Uh, I believe I had alcohol poisoning a couple of times. Um, but those were really kind of a rare rarity. It wasn't something that happened that often. Um, you know, the parties that going to parties, kegers, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, after I had my son, I got a little more serious. And then so did my alcoholism or AUD. I was hiding vodka um, in coat pockets of all things and closets that seemed like a good place to hide them. And I was doing some of those kind of things that got some people's attention. So I um, put myself into inpatient treatment for the first time, got back out. I don't think I lasted that long. It's kind of a blur since it was so long ago. Um, But that was, it was leading up to some problems. And then when it really hit hard was in my forties. It was not playing around any more time. It was, it was pretty severe. Um, And then the latter part of, before I found TSM, it was uh, deadly severe, um, like death um seizure that kind of severe severity of my my AUD that's crazy so you were in and out of different treatments it sounds like and from what I know from your story a bit you were also in and out of AA is that right 
That's correct. I started a, a my mom um, actually has 40 years this, this year. Um, she got sober with AA. And so of course I was 15 when she got sober. So it was a good time to drag all the kids to Al-Anon, al <laughs> and, and AA. So I grew up kind of in an AA, um, you know, from 15, but I, I think that made me also rebel a little bit more. Um, but I did, AA used to be a great time. I mean, they would have parties and, you know, sober, obviously. <laughs> but um, there was a lot of caring people that I saw in and out of our house on the couch, um, AA meetings. So that was a, <clears throat> so obviously I would, I went to AA, you know, so many times over the course of the 40 years that, and I met the one some of the most caring, loving people there. And uh, um, so I'm forever grateful for what I did learn and for the people that did help me through Alcoholics Anonymous and that I am grateful for. Yes, lots of AA in my past. Yeah, thank you for sharing that because I know a lot of people come to TSM from AA and my dad is also sober through AA, so I'm very grateful for it. Um, but I find that they often come to TSM with maybe mixed emotions. Like I know I often hear you talk very positively of your experience, like the things you took away from it and the things that helped you and the things that maybe you still carry with you today. But then there are challenges for some people as well, just the nature of the program and, and how it works and how it might not work for people. Um, anything you want to say there? Yeah, there's, and, and I can see all of the reasons. I think where AA shined for me was it uh, worked on the inner part of me and take away the the shame based. Okay, I, but it's shame based, and and that's not that's not great for um, people that are trying to you know fix their AUD. It's not a good thing. But I did learn a lot about being kind, um, forgiveness. Um, there's there's a lot of good stuff in there, and it may be antiquated and old and kind of washed out. But there's some really good things in there as well. Um, but the shame base, I mean, there's a lot of things that didn't go so good in AA as well. Um, I have a lot of stories about those not so good times. But in a whole, um, it helped me mold me to be the kind of person that I am today, in a sense, because I was so young. And I came from such a very uh, dysfunctional home life. My home life was extremely dysfunctional and um, very abusive. Yeah. And so... It, it did give me a little bit of framework on how to, I, I think I would have been a good person no matter what, but I think that it, it did help instill that in me. Yeah. So it's, it's good values. That's good. That's good to hear. I mean, it sounds like it's been a big part of your life. Um, so tell us, you know, what led you to the Sinclair method? Like, what was your drinking like? Maybe kind of, you know, you talked a bit about it, but like, you know, right before you started the method and, and what led you to TSM after trying, you know, rehab and AA and other things? Um, the one uh, method that I didn't, that I passed over, because, man, my history so goes so far back. It's hard to remember everything. But um, I did try aversion therapy, too, which was super strange and scary and not very safe but I did go to a, a hospital for that where you would drink until you got sick and then drink some more and then the days you didn't drink you would have sodium pentothal they would shoot you up with and they called it sleepy time and um, I did that for 10 days and a few follow-ups as they advertised <laughs> it was called chick shadle Oh my gosh. Okay. I briefly remember you mentioning this to me, but it like in another conversation, um, but it slipped my mind. So, oh my gosh, that is that even a treatment anymore? Does that exist? They closed the last one in um, South Seattle. Wow. Was it effective? No. Not at all? Not at all? <laughs> no. I, I, I think I started drinking 10 days after I got <laughs> before the follow-ups, I was already drinking. <laughs> Because you go in there for 10 days inpatient, and then when you leave, you have these follow-ups by the phone, and I was already, I was actually drunk on my first follow-up. I feel like that's what we do to ourselves when we're drinking. Like, you know, we drink until we're sick, and then we drink some more. Like, that, if that's what the treatment is, it's like, I can do that for free at my house. I'm used to this, but yeah. no. It was pretty horrific, the, the drinking, and they put you in a small little uh, closet, and it was really hot. 
in there and it was really small and you were in there with a, a registered nurse who was giving you shots to make you um, like niacin to make you really hot uh, to make it as comfortable uncomfortable as possible um it kind of like if you eat too much pumpkin pie at thanksgiving you're not going to want pumpkin pie anymore that kind of thing and um what happened to me is i never threw up and so then they had to do a tongue to, it was just all humiliating and um not good it's like you have food poisoning and you're drunk at the same time oh that's terrible so it wasn't that fun so but you so were hungry for an answer brenda like that's what i'm hearing from you after like decades of battling you wanted a solution to this problem i did i was looking for a solution anywhere um i told you about i did some microdosing um marijuana acid mushrooms uh, you know i was looking for an answer anyone that would that would tell me hey here's a, here's a solution i was ready to listen yeah so what did you like you know one of the main reasons i know looking back for me why it was so hard for me to quit drinking despite my sincere desire to fix this problem um it was that it was the craving and the desire that would always lead me back to it um it would just get overwhelming to where i would be like okay i'm just going to sacrifice my health or my family relationships or my marriage like i just need a drink like i can't go on another minute without a drink so what was your experience like in those treatments like what is it that led you to relapse over and over again pretty much the same it was um it was beyond me this the grips were i, I couldn't uh rationalize it i i couldn't understand it um you know being raised in aa i saw people that did not drink and that white knuckled it went to meetings um and i didn't want that to be my life i didn't want to you know go to AA the rest of my life and um, go to meetings, uh, so it was I just couldn't control the obsession. That's what it was. It was an obsession. I could do it for a little while, mm -hmm. and I and I had five years in AA at one time. I had three years, I had two years. Um, so it was always the alcohol deprivation that would get me, and I would go back, and I would go back, and that's that's what led up to before I came into TSM was that the alcohol deprivation again, once, once again, hit me. I, in 2017, no, I'm sorry, 19, uh, my son came home from college and he saw how much I was drinking and he was, he was not happy that, you know, he, because I was an AA, he was an AA kind of from the sidelines growing up. And so he knew, whatever was going on with me was not a good thing mm. and with his disappointment because I adore him so much he's my only child and uh, yeah uh, sorry his disappointment in me was really hard and so yeah. I was I was bound and determined and I, I um, found Andy Grace another you know another thing I tried great lady um, great program um, sorry I found her and so I quit cold turkey um, and I quit for three weeks and I had really, really, really bad. Um, I didn't really know about, I always thought DTs and um, those kind of things happen to people way worse than me. I mean, we always don't think it's us, but I was, I was scratching myself like crazy at night. Um, I'm sure it was something to do with my liver um yeah not my liver was not doing well and um I didn't go to a doctor or anything um and so anyways I quit drinking for three weeks um his time had passed here and he was moving on to do his other thing and so he had left and I lost in that course of time I'd lost like three three really good friends that had died not um, not to all to alcoholism the AUD. Anyways, there's a lot of stress in my life at the time as well. Um, anyway, so I quit drinking and then um, one night alcohol deprivation got me again and I drank a bottle and a half of wine. Mm. And the next day I had like a seizure. Oh, um, no. Yeah, it was pretty scary. I couldn't walk. I couldn't, I was slurring my words. I was actually talking to a girlfriend at the time and she was she was just crying she's like you're you're having a stroke Brenda she's just she was she didn't know what to do 
And uh, she's like, call 911, call 911. And um, so I got the phone. I couldn't look the phone. So I was trying to call 911 and I couldn't really talk. Anyways, uh, long story short, they came, the paramedics, and they asked me what I was on. And I said, well, I drink. They didn't believe me. They thought I was on drugs. Oh, wow. Yeah, because I was trying to tell them I'd only drink a bottle and a half. I don't even know if it was a bottle and a half the night before. Anyways, um, I got into ER. I got punched in the stomach because the the ER doc was trying to triage to see what was wrong with me. My blood pressure went up to 210 over 110. <gasps> Oh my gosh. We did very poorly, very poorly. People yelling at me, what was I on? And, you know, I, I guess, you know, with all the drugs and stuff, they didn't rec- recognize that it was just alcohol. I wasn't on, yeah, I wasn't on any drugs. I was just, um, you know, that's that kindling that I found. I didn't even know what that was, but now I do. And uh, my, because I would quit, drink, quit, drink, quit, drink over and over trying to find the answer. I made my, uh, all my um, detoxing was so severe. My withdrawals were so severe, yeah. uh, but they gave me a couple of bags of fluid, um, lots of luxury. We know they did blood tests so they could tell I wasn't on anything by the time I'd already gone through all the torture and wow. it, was, it was, they were not nice. They were not nice to me at all. And wow. my husband even works at that same hospital. So that wasn't very pleasant. Uh, but that that got um, I st- that started in 2019, 2020 is when I found TSM. But I've been I was taking naltrexone, but not the TSM way, and so it wasn't working. And the first couple times I had taken it, it made me feel like crap. I I felt horrible, so I quit taking it. Um, wow. So how were you prescribed it initially without being aware of TSM? Um. Well, oh, I forgot. That was another treatment. Um, I put myself back in. <laughs> and it's a merry-go-round, a treatment center. Um, I put myself into outpatient treatment, uh, extensive, which was two days a week. It happened to be a, another fellow outpatient person <laughs> there for the same reason. He had was put on it from his doctor. And he came in and he was just raving about how this medication took away his cravings. And then I heard my um, someone that carried mail that, that she was telling me that she had taken it and it helped with her cravings. So of course I got on it um, from my doctor, but I had to try another drug for a couple months because she didn't want to. They were she was afraid. It, um, I think it was a he at that time was afraid of prescribing it. The, the Interesting. Morning, the liver, the whole thing. He was just and now knowing what I know, that's just all crazy absolutely you know the the alcohol was 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 hurting me way more than naltrexone could ever ever hurt me my liver was hurting all the time on my right side it stung a lot and you know that's not a good feeling to have no oh my gosh Brenda you've gone through so much like what an amazing story you have to tell having lived through all of that and now you're here as a TSM success story and even when you started naltrexone it's like you had side effects and you didn't feel great on it and maybe you weren't taking it following the TSM protocol way so that was like a rough start I know it's interesting too because I hear anecdotally and I know there is some research to, sh- to show that naltrexone can help with cravings when people are abstinent um, but others like yourself, you know, I hear from people that are like, it didn't do anything for me. Like TSM is what worked. So I know it it can work and it does work for people, but more often I see the Sinclair method protocol be the more effective way. So like, how often were you taking it when you first started it? Did you just have the side effects and you stopped it right away? Or what was that like? Yeah, basically what there's so, I have, you know, like you were saying, thanks for sharing and like, uh, I forget exact words. But God, that's only what I can remember. You know, like there's so many things that um, I've been I have been through, and one of them was an abuse. So I took an abuse uh, back in oh God, two thousand six, seven, somewhere around there once again, and that was not a good deal. I actually drank on an abuse, which um, you're wow. not supposed to do, but that's how bad my cravings were for alcohol. Um, Sorry, I went back to my an abuse self and I was just like, oh my God, that was just, 
I, I think I forgot your question, Katie. <laughs> I just went right back to Anabuse and went, oh my God, that was horrible. No, I did not know that you were on Anabuse too. So did, just on a quick side, like, did you find that effective? I mean, obviously you drank on it, so probably not. And that was probably a terrible experience, but I know doctors today that just won't prescribe it because they don't find it to be very humane. So just briefly, what was your experience like on Anabuse? It, um, I don't remember feeling any side effects per se of it, but it didn't take away, well, obviously it won't take away any cravings. Um, it's just a deterrent. So, you know, like, oh, I could die if I drink. So I'm not going to drink because I might die. It's like, it doesn't work that way when you have AUD, you're going to find a way. And I just drank on it. Like I was, I was a little, to be honest, really afraid, um, you know, but I took it slow. Yeah. But, like I started out slow to see how it would go. And then, you know, found out like, um, well, I can drink on this. Uh, mm. And so it did, it was not a good the one thing really bad that I got out of it was I have these permanent rashes now from it. I have them on my knees, um, uh, different places on my body. And, that, and the only thing I can think of it, it was during that anabuse. I think, gosh, I think I was on it like eight months. Wow. You know, I was giving it a real good college try because I wanted to quit drinking. Yeah. And obviously it wasn't working. So it was yeah. really hard to quit taking it. Um, wow. So what was your experience like when you started on the naltrexone? Like how many attempts did you have on the medication? How did you deal with the side effects? Like tell us, I guess, about like the beginning of you starting on NAL in 2020, you said? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I actually started it in 2015 and then um, 2019. I started a few other times before I found the TSM way. Um, so it was basically, I thought it was like, this has to be an abuse. <laughs> I'm taking it and I'm getting sick, so I'm not going to take it. And uh, I remember laughing because my friend and I both started at the same time and we were all super excited, like this is the answer. And we both were like, I'm not doing this. Um, and uh, so I quit taking it. And then... Um, that's just because the side effects you had from it, you were like, never mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No one told me, hey, maybe you should take some, you know, eat a little food with it, or maybe you should uh, drink some water or anything like that. I just thought it was, you know, going to take away this urge to drink. And so taking it made me sick. That, that wasn't, you know, I've already done the, all the other things, the abuse and whatnot. So I just quit. I just I went back to drinking and then got desperate again, became desperate again, and then found it again somehow. It just kept reappearing in my life. And then I had old bottles, you know, that had been hanging around for the first time, second time, third time. And then I would try it here and there just to see if <laughs> it could do something different. <laughs> and, and then when I found um, Claudia's TED Talk, then things started making sense. And that's when um, I connected the dots about how you're supposed to take it and possibly eat some food on it. But I did, it did, I did have um, side effects so pretty severe. Wow. Yeah. wow. Can you tell us a little bit? Because I know side effects can be surprising for people, especially like you. You didn't have the right information about maybe starting at a lower dose or having it with food and water, those types of things, which are just really simple, basic things, but they can really cause someone to stay on the medication or say, oh my gosh, I'm never taking this again, because you can feel so awful if you take a full dose, especially on an empty stomach, and especially if you're hungover, I've I've learned. Um, so how did you, like when you kept trying the medication and decided to stick to it finally, how did you navigate those side effects? How did you approach it? Uh, so I forced another doctor to take me on <laughs> because I, I was like, okay, we're going to give this another try, but I was armed with information this time with the TSM way. And so I found a natural path, um, that did not want anything to do with it, but, um, still she was, help she was semi-helpful, but, uh, she had me take a quarter of it. She'd be like, drink, take a quarter of it, go to bed. And I did that for, I think three weeks. And that's how I got acclimated. And then I went up to a half of 50 milligrams and I went up, you know, I just kept yeah. gradually going up until eventually 
I could take it with almost out any food or water or very little where before it was, you know, I had to pamper it and be really, you know, careful about how I took it. And, um, and, you know, I haven't drank for, well, be coming up on six months that it, um, yeah, six months that I haven't, and I'm a little bit afraid to take it again because oh, wow. it's almost an aversion to me you know, because I'd have to tirade up to yeah. get to it again um because i would have those same side effects i'm afraid so to me i look at i don't really really want to drink alcohol um i don't even think about it but if i did want to drink a drink which people that don't have aud have one drink i have to take this nasty pill (laughs) i don't want to take this nasty pill so i would rather not have that one drink thank you very much (laughs) Yeah, isn't that amazing? Like I was just ch- sharing today about how drinking started to feel like a chore for me on Naltrexone, where it was like, yeah, I can drink, but it just sounds like a lot of work and I'd rather not. And maybe for you, it's like, okay, you have to think about the medication and doing the dosing and how you're going to adjust to it again. So I honestly didn't know that you hadn't drank in six months. So that's that's awesome. Because I know I've talked to you to, before and you want to be a moderate drinker. I think you said that recently, like I want to be a moderate drinker, but I keep not wanting to drink or something like you're trying to be a moderate drinker yeah, but been... I, I tried I really did try to give it and I still have champagne I've had champagne in my house like for I don't know four months it's still in the refrigerator because wine which was my <clears throat> was well my first love was vodka and I knew I knew it was going to kill me I knew it I there's no doubt in my mind it was it was killing me so I quit I gave that up like 15 years ago but so it was the wine um yeah. Chardonnay was my thing. I love Chardonnay. Kendall Jackson. I mean, oh, anyways, I love Chardonnay. Now I can't stand it. Oh, like, wow. I don't even like even the a glass of it on a TV or something. I'm like, ooh, I don't like it. And red wine, I'm like, oh no. So, anyways, now I'm down to Coors Light or Champagne, and I'm like, well, let's. I've never really had much champagne in my whole career, so now I have that in my refrigerator. There's been three times that I was going to open it, you know, well, I thought about opening it, but then I'd have to get on the pill and do all that stuff. And it just hasn't. So it sits there. And yeah. it, so there it is. Um, I've tried to give it away to a couple of people and they're like, no, no, champagne gives me a headache. Nobody wants it. That's so funny. That's so funny. <laughs> wow. So how long were you actively on T? I mean, you're still technically on TSM because, you know, you might drink again one day. So how long were you, have you been practically practicing the protocol? Um, It'll be three years next week or next week, next month in a couple weeks that I started. It was July, 2023. uh, Will be three years. Yeah. That I start um, back up on. Because I had my heart, because of that incident in 2019, um, that I got punched in the gut. At- <laughs> <laughs> but that's really going to stand out forever, you know, how many years? Like, ago? literally, did he punched you in the gut. Why? Yeah, she. Or she. she wanted, yeah, she wanted to know if my liver was hurting. <laughs> and if, it wasn't hurting that day, or, you know. Like, I, now it is. <laughs> I asked her, I said, what the hell are you doing punching me? And she never replied, but I knew because it was on my right side, just below my rib cage. I knew what, what she was doing because the whole lead up to it was, you know, you're, you're, you're a drunk. I mean, they wow. treated substandard because of my AUD wow. instead of treating me with some kindness because I was going through this altering. I mean, whatever the heck was happening to me, I'd never been there before. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So yeah, that, and then I've been, oh gosh, I think if you will, some people I know don't like the word extinction, but you know, I extinguished my AUD, I would say uh, close to a year now. So wow. really, and I still drank, you know, here and there, but um, it just, I just gave it up. I was just like, you know, I, I, I don't even know. I didn't even have to think about giving it up. I think about alcohol as much as I think about eggs, like you know, I have a good egg once in a while, but I don't obsess over it. And I surely don't eat 12 of them. You know, I might eat two, sometimes on the outside three, I think, oh, I really want three eggs. And I end up giving one of them to my dogs usually. <laughs> well, you know, that's about, 
about it. You don't give the alcohol to your dogs, though, right? No, 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 the eggs, the eggs, yeah. No, 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 no alcohol. I love the egg analogy. It's so true. It just becomes, it's like this inanimate object. Like, there's no story, no emotion. Like, sure, I'll have a couple eggs. I'll have a couple drinks, but probably not. Uh, kind of that way where... I just don't think about it that often. You know, I have a dozen in my refrigerator that will be there for a long time. And then I have to be like, are they safe? I don't know. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, alcohol, like, I don't know. The the champagne's shoved back there somewhere. I'm sure you're behind the egg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it has less value than the eggs because it's yeah. back behind it. Uh, that's how much I think about it. Yeah. It's funny because I recently just found a bottle of champagne in my refrigerator too. And I was laughing because I was cleaning out the fridge. I was like, where did this come from? And how long has it been here? Whereas before that would have been drunk long ago. Like there wouldn't be no champagne in my fridge. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So just to put some like dates or timelines on things, it sounds like you've, okay, you've been on three TSM almost three years. You were on it for about two years before you reached extinction and then you were you've been drinking moderately for the past year post extinction. Um, well, I haven't really, I haven't even drank. Um, the last time I could, like, I don't even think about it was Christmas when okay. um, that I had, um, a couple glasses of wine and then I didn't, I did not, I had a stomach ache from it so bad and it wasn't the naltrexone. I never got stomach aches from it. It was just, the rich food, the wine, I don't know. And the, it just didn't appeal to me. And so I really haven't had the desire or, or yeah, just more of an aversion. Like I just don't yeah. want, it. not what I, what I crave or what I want. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. It's like the body isn't used to it anymore. Even when I was on TSM drinking once a month, I would feel the effects of the alcohol just in an unpleasant way. And I have a dear friend who she's never drank. She's never likes alcohol. And I was asking her, I'm like, why don't you like it? She's like, I don't like the way it makes me feel. I don't like the way it makes me taste like, or the way it tastes. I don't like, um, I just don't, she just doesn't like anything about it. And so I was like, I kind of feel like how she does now where I just like, don't get anything good from the alcohol anymore, uh, which is how I started drinking. I don't know about you, but when I started drinking, I had to like force them down. I didn't really care for them. And I know that's not true for everyone. Some people like from their first drink, they know, okay, this is it. But um, I just feel like I went back to that person where I just didn't really care about alcohol anymore. That's where I'm at. I just yeah. have no appeal at all. I don't hate it. <clears throat> Uh, you know, my sister and I went for a bike ride yesterday, stopped and had shared a hamburger and she had a beer and uh, the, we were at a bar outside bar and the bartender was trying to get me to, I said, I'll have a um, club or a soda water with lime. He goes, ah, I'll put some vodka in that. And I said, no, thanks. He goes, come on, don't make your, you know, friend drink alone. And I'm like, oh no, I, <laughs> she's let me drink alone many times. <laughs> I was like we're good you know but and then he was trying to like really get me to drink and I said no really I don't and I, then I finally just said I, I can't have alcohol and then he was like oh he got and I can have alcohol you know my sister too but it was just like I wanted him to quit like I just don't wow. and that sounded so horrible to have a shot of vodka in my I thought oh what why would you ruin it and then you're gonna pay me it charged me to ruin my <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I don't want any vodka in it. And um, my sister asked when he left, she goes, you know, you, you can drink, right? And I'm like, oh, yeah. I said, if I, you know, take my uh, naltrexone, I said, but I don't have any desire. And yeah. she's like, oh, I mean, that's just, I mean, she's, you know, we're 13 months apart. We've always known, you know, and so that that's blowing her mind too. watching me um with my pro progression with tsm and she's very proud of me by the way it's been really yeah she's glad i mean like just what i told you and there's been other things i've done too but uh i never gave up i kept looking and searching for the answer and i found it yeah living proof here today i don't think i was going to live much longer um before I found TSM with that, with that incident, which landed me a pacemaker, um, wow. out of it. Um, so 
I don't know. That's another, uh, maybe another topic, but I've been put on uh, benzodiazepines all years ago. And so I was drinking all of that alcohol plus taking benzos. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm lucky that, uh, you know, and you have to slowly taper off. And so when you asked me, like, when's the last time I really drank, I was always feeling these weird feelings and I thought it was always alcohol, but it wasn't. It was a lot of it was the benzodiazepine because even though I have not drank, I still feel that those wow. things. But yeah, I have a retracted, um, I, I, well, it's not been that long, but I've been gradually going off the benzodiazepines. The, the, one of them I stopped that day. And I didn't know. I just thought they were sleeping pills. I, I did not know that they were that dangerous. Wow. I warned people. I mean, like if anyone's ever going to be on one of those, be on it very short term for uh, alcohol withdrawal. And that's not why I was on it. I was on it from uh, sleep issues. Well, no wonder I couldn't sleep very good because the homeostasis, like the alcohol would put you to sleep. And then you'd wake up like at three in the morning, like wide awake. Well, there, there you have it was the alcohol. So then I was taking the benzodiazepines on top of the alcohol. Wow. So super dangerous. I didn't, I didn't. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. That. Say crazy. that again. I'm still feeling the effects from that. Wow. The, um, the central nervous system is not quite right yet from the, the drinking and the benzodiazepines. So what does that feel like? Like, what are the effects? Um, sometimes I have, um, like if I get nervous, um, it can really affect me or the fight or flight comes on for me. I feel, <clears throat> excuse me, dizzy. Wow. Um, I don't like seeing um, like television shows or anything that's um, hurting any kind of blood or, that all affects me. Um, so I have to be very careful what I watch because my, my nervous system is just like on hyper alert. Um, and that's from what I've read and everything that I've looked into. So wow. It can be, you know, I thought, it, I think I was telling you this uh, not too long ago, I, I didn't feel good. And I thought it was COVID, you know, who knows what, I thought it was all, could be anything. And now looking back, it's, it was, I'm pretty sure the benzos um, and they've been, I've been on them for so long. 12 years is a long time. Um, a benzodiazepine. And um, I caution, I mean, that, that's probably the worst thing. I mean, it's bad. It's not a good drug. I mean, it's good in the right, re I mean, there, people do need them. Like right before surgery, it helps relax you. Um, there's reasons why it's, you know, it is, it's safer than barbiturates, which, you know, is why they came up with benzodiazepines because so many people were uh, withdrawing or having bad, were dying on, on uh, you know, that's the Elvis drug. You know, people were dying on that. And so these are supposed to be safe. And a lot of doctors don't really know, um, maybe don't even care, that kind of thing. I don't, I don't know. But it's been, that mixed with alcohol is a recipe for disaster. So if anyone is on that, I, I tell you, it's, you know, talk to, talk to a doctor and, and slow taper off. Yeah. I wow. Never I never once abused them. I took them as prescribed. So it wasn't, but I was also abusing my alcohol. Um, so I was drinking like a bottle and a quarter, bottle and a half a night, which is not, I mean, I'm a fairly, you know, good sized woman. So it wasn't. I mean, I know people that drink three or four bottles, you know, and it's like, eh. but because of the benzodiazepines on top of it, I was really, I don't even know how much that would equate to wow. um, drinking. My goodness. Wow. So you've just had a lot of things to overcome through TSM. Like there's been so many different health consequences, which I think a lot of people can relate to because often they're on different medications or they've had other addictions or things like that um, when they come to TSM. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. If I can help someone else from going through what I went through or still going through, yeah. and it can last 10 years, what these symptoms I'm having. Wow. Um, they're, yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not been fun. It's Jeez. been worse than the alcohol withdrawal I've ever had. Wow. 
Mm -hmm. Wow. So I'm curious to kind of go back and understand, Brenda, a bit about your two year plus TSM journey and like the couple of years you were like really practicing it and seeing the gradual reduction in your drinking and things like that. Um, what was that like for you just in general? Like, were you a fast responder? Uh, or, you know, what was difficult about it? You know, what was surprising? And we can kind of dive more into that. But I just want to hear more about kind of like when you were in the trenches of your TSM journey, in particular, like the early to middle and end phases of it, just so people can get a picture of what that was like for you. Um, so, you know, of course I was hoping it was going to be a miracle, like all the other things I tried. Um, and, and, and I have to say it is a miracle, but, um, there was a lot of work along the way. So when I first started taking, uh, the TS correct way, one hour waiting, one hour, taking my pill, waiting one hour and then drinking, um, I drank probably the first few months, just like I normally did. I mean, there was a reduction and there was, um, I remember the first time I waited the hour, had a glass of wine, and it just sat there. And it was that is when I knew, wow, there's something different about this. Because the times I'd taken it before and got sick, I didn't even drink. So I would never even know because, you know, it said on the bottle. And by the way, my bottle still says take daily and do not drink. Okay. So we know that's not the way we do it. But um, uh, so that was. The, yeah that was how I was so I would just drink I'm trying to think it seems so long ago like a different person so forgive me if I have to kind of like dig through my memory I did that for a long time months um just and I'd have some uh reduction I, I was reducing anyways just because I but you know half of it is you not just the alcohol and so I hadn't, wasn't really working on any of that. I mean, I started to, um, I was going to embody daily meetings <clears throat> and those were really, really super helpful. I mean, like TSM just alone, just with the pill, the, the support is what makes it. Um, if I had just sat here and taken it the right way after watching Claudia's video and then not reached out to anyone, I don't think I would have made it. Um, I had that support, which was really paramount because um, I got so many tricks and tips and encouragement. The encouragement was just nobody beat me up and said, you know, you got to start at day one. Give me your chip. <laughs> you know? Bad Brenda. You know, I didn't get any. I got a lot of suggestions like um, drink in a different room don't take your glass with you. I mean, there were so many things that were just mind blowing to me at the time that worked. They absolutely worked. And so when I started getting in and I think I had my mind, uh, my brain had to get clear too. I mean, I'd been drinking for so long. I was foggy and then the benzodiazepines on top of it. Um, so it took a while for me to, uh, to, to just start reducing and then, um, you know, I was following all these uh, um, Facebook groups and stuff like that because Thrive wasn't there at that time, wasn't invented. And then I started working on the behaviors and the habits. And those took a long time. So the last year was before I had reached extinction was all working on behaviors and habits and trying to you know, incorporate them with my use of alcohol. Like delay, wait, ask yourself why, you know, just who would ever think that those kind of things, when you want something, you just go grab it and drink it or eat it. You know, you don't think, well, why do I want this sandwich? Well, because I'm hungry. Well, is there something else, you know, or, oh, well, maybe I'm feeling kind of sad. Now I'm eating because I'm sad. Well, we do some things with um, so many things. I was mindful. Yeah. And I'm so glad you brought that up because I think it's something that we have to first become aware of. You know, it's, it's I, for me at least, and I've heard from others, it's like our drinking is done very mindlessly. And so it takes effort to even just become aware of what we're doing. Cause like you're saying, it's like, oh, it's five o'clock. I drink at five o'clock. It's just what I do. And that habit can still perpetuate even when on naltrexone and the Sinclair method. So 
you know, with you, I, I hear a lot of people and see a lot of people in our program who've been on the method for six months, nine months, a year, two years, and they feel discouraged if they haven't reached that extinction point yet, or just that feeling of being free from the problems with alcohol. But I think your story is kind of a perf perfect example of, you know, you can still have success with TSM, even if it takes you longer to get there, because you reached extinction, it sounds like after your first year on the method, there were still changes to be uh, made, it sounds like. Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, it was two years. Um, so it was two years after starting TSM that I reached extinction. So in that two years was a lot of time. Um, oh my gosh, re reduction, AF days. You know, I had actually had weeks where I had AF days and then just go, you know, I still hadn't reached extinction. I mean, it was still in my lizard brain, alcohol was. It was still controlling me. It wasn't, um, it wasn't free from it. Mm -hmm. And that's when I would call extinction, extinction is when you're not thinking about it. It isn't a part, I didn't, I don't wake up thinking about alcohol. I don't, you know, the, the champagne's over there. It's fine. It's going to live there probably forever. Um, I don't think about it, you know? And so that was the extinguished part. But I remember so it was so hard, um, even being on, you know, TSM for a year, year and a half, like, what am I going to do with myself? That was hard. It was like Pavlov's dog, ring the bell, Brenda drinks, you know, and that was happening, you know, and I had to really look at that, um, get off work. I right, well, I'd take my pill at three o'clock, get off work at four, drive home, drink, you know, and it's like, I knew there was my problem this right there and uh I had to get I had to switch that up that was what needed to be addressed the pill was doing its job beautifully it was doing its job I couldn't ask more for a medication to do anything more than what it was doing it was working its butt off helping me out <laughs> So how did you address that habit piece? Because you're spot on and that's what people experience. They'll say, I don't really want to drink, but it's what I do every night. It's how I unwind after work. And you nailed it. That is the where the work comes in and where we have to engage the protocol. And why we always say like naltrexone and TSM are half of it. And the other half is how you're meeting the medication halfway and doing the behavior change and the mindfulness and the mindset. So just practically, like, how did you approach that? Like, if you have an example or two, I'm curious. Oh, I, I got a few. Um, so the best I could do, because I knew if I could get, if I could switch it up at work, right after work, and some of this comes from my old AA thinking too, my sponsor would say, um, I worked at a, a very famous place. And um, when I get off work, she would say, right after work, I want you to walk over to that snack bar and get a pizza or a hot dog. You'll probably know what the place is. And I would go, okay. She goes, do that and then go to a meeting. So that was my thinking. I was like, okay, how am I going to do it different? And I have to reward myself somehow. My reward was taco time. So I would get off work, drive down the hill towards taco time, not to my house. And that was the best I could do at that time was, and I was like, okay, you know, the calories in, you know, alcohol, a bottle of wine, that's like, you know, 800 calories, I bet around there. And this, you know, <laughs> this meal at taco time, you, you know, cause then I was like, oh, you know, the lizard came out and said, well, look at what you're doing fatty. <laughs> you know, <laughs> eating all this bad food. And so I wrestled with that too, but then I was like, okay, but this is better. I'll deal with this problem at taco time and then I'll deal with the alcohol. But taco time is what, you know, this is going to save me from that alcohol. And it did. And so I would eat my, my meal and then I would drive home. And because my belly was full and I, I kind of itched that scratch, you know, by eating then I was able to have an AF day and that's how they started. And, you know, I still, I mean, I cut back my taco time. <laughs> I do still go once in a while, but, um, you know, now I reward myself with an ice cream. Like uh, McDonald's has these little ice creams and I, and I did then too. I would, you know, at, at night after the taco time run and come home, then I'd be like, now what do I do with myself? I don't want to drink. I'm not going to drink because I had my pill. I had my food. I'm full. Um, then what? And then I would start doing some walking. 
-hmm. they weren't very big walks they were just small I mean I'm up to miles now but they were small little walks and then after the walk sit down okay now what am I going to do you know hand wrangling what am I going to do what am I going to do and then it'd be like okay I'm going to grab the dog and I'm going to go to McDonald's and get a little ice cream and I'd have that ice cream and that that was you know by the, the end of the night it was like you know eight o'clock nine like okay now I got it now I, I'm going to be okay I, I I'm past the witching hour I'm, I'm... yeah that's how you do it little by slow and then I started adding other things to it other things I would do and now gosh it's so like I don't even know why I was so preoccupied with what do I do now I have so many things that I choose or choose not to do. Now I'm tired because I can't keep up with all the things I want to do. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing, but alcohol robs you of so much and it robbed me of time. Oh my gosh, all the time that I wasted. I mean, just not in my body and beating it up. But um, now I have, life is rich. I wake up with joy and I never had joy before. I didn't wake up with any joy. Um, like when we get done talking with you, I'm like, oh my gosh, I could go for a walk. I could do that. Or I could go. There's so many things that I could do. Um, and it's just endless. Yeah. You said that so beautifully, Brenda. And I'm, I really appreciate that you brought up the fact of just how simple it was, like these little things you did. I mean, going to taco time for that reward. Um, it, I think that that's how the changes really happen when people are in that place like you were stuck on the method where it's like you see the medication working, but you've got this habit playing out that you can't break. And I just, you know, my encouragement to people listening is that, you know, it doesn't have to be any major challenge you go out and do you don't have to go out and take up rock climbing and buy all the equipment and, you know make it difficult it's like going to taco time or you know me too i would go get ice cream at the local shop and i'd like walk downtown and make kind of like a nice little ritual out of it and that would delay my drinking enough to see okay like maybe i can have an alcohol free day today or maybe i can start a little bit later in the day and i know for me before tsm trying to do those little tips and tricks were they, they didn't work because my, my mind was still craving alcohol. So I would do that thing and I'd be like, okay, great. I still want to drink, you know, but with TSM, I find that if we can just do these things consistently and try new things, which it sounds like you did paired with like the lack of desire or the reduced desire to drink, it's like a perfect combination. And we see ourselves get through it at the end of the day. We're like, okay, I don't want to drink. That was a success. Like I can do that again. And it's these little steps and, and changes that don't have to be significant. It can be one little thing. I'm going to go to taco time and see how I feel after that. Um, it sounds like that worked for you. And I love that you said too, it's like now you have all this, all these options of things to do where before it was like alcohol was the only thing we are that you were focusing on. And now it's like, you see there's, I wrote an article recently, like there was this whole new world of options opened up of like a million and one things I could do, but alcohol had become that sole focus. And I remember I shared this quote recently of um, Huberman, he like from Huberman's labs, he said, an addiction is a gradual narrowing of the things that bring you pleasure. And I just thought that defined it so simply that it's an, a gradual narrowing of the things that bring you pleasure. So like you and I having had the alcohol issues, it's like, that was the only thing we were living for and going after every night and every day. And like, that was the one and only prize. Um, but as soon as you kind of break free from it, and particularly through TSM, you see, oh my gosh, like I have this whole world of things that bring me pleasure. I can go for a walk. I can get ice cream. I can watch a movie. I can hang out with my pets. I can take a nap, like, or, you know, anything and everything in between. So I think that's one of the things that was such, um, a big eye opener for me as well. And it sounds like for you also, it's like, there's so many things we can do and enjoy in this life and alcohol. For me, I feel like it kind of lied to me thinking it was the only thing that brought me joy and the only thing that brought me fun. Uh, when really it, it, it maybe did that for a few moments, but then it would be gone after that. And then I'd be paying for it with a hangover. And like you said, you know, you feel the true joy now where before with alcohol, I think it would give me momentary happiness, but I honestly feel like it robbed me of that sincere joy where it's just like that joy to be alive for no other reason than just like to be alive. Um, anything? Yeah. What else would you like to say on that or anything else you'd like to add? Spot on. Um, it, it, alcohol lied to me. There's a book it's by, uh, I forget his first name, Beck. Um, oh, I yeah. have all these books. I mean, there's 
been using my Audible for years, <laughs> trying to, and I still listen to a lot of them. I listen to the Cure uh, for Alcoholism over and over. Um, Babylon Confidential. Um, you know, I I listen to. I got a huge library of them, and um, they've all helped. And yeah, but alcohol did it. It lied. It, you know, it's. Um, I think you and I have used, you know, and it's, uh, you and I have talked about this a long time ago, was that alcohol was like a really toxic relationship with great sex. And it's not sustainable. You can't just have that. I know it's just, it's not going to work, you know, that's in it, but it lied. It was um, alluring and now it's, it's, it's lost its, its appeal altogether. <laughs> But no, you, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. You see it for what it is. You're like, oh, okay. You're not that cool after all. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not getting the endorphin reward. I don't like how you taste. I don't like how you feel. <laughs> I don't like anything about it. I, especially now that I haven't drank in so long, I can smell it really. Like it, it's so weird. Like the hand sanitizer everyone used through COVID. I can smell when I smell that um, and smell beer smell on someone's breath. They smell a little bit similar, like, oh, and it's weird that I'm, I never would have smelled that before or cared yeah. or thought about it. Um, Same. Yeah, it definitely, definitely lied to me. Yeah. Lied, lied to a lot of us. I don't even know anymore what alcohol is even good for. I mean, I don't, I, I can't even think of a reason it is good for anything you know, I, I did have some really good times. Like, you know, I had some, we had some really good times being alcohol. We really did. Um, you know, in the beginning, like that bad relationship, mm -hmm. uh, it was fun romancing in the beginning, but then it, it yeah, a good relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple more questions, I guess, for you before we wrap up, this has been such a great conversation. I was curious, just in general, to hear from you, were there things about the Sinclair method and this whole treatment protocol the last three years that you've been practicing it? What has been, you know, particularly difficult for you on this journey? The 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 version to the pill has been the most difficult. The the way it makes me feel. Um, I don't think I would have reached. I. I may, you know, just want to have a drink here and there if I didn't like, you know, because that pill makes me, you know, I would, like yesterday, I may have, I mean, we were sweaty, hot, bike ride, but I mean, the, the soda was fine. It, it tasted just great, but um, it did look kind of good. She was, she was like, and it was called a ditzy blonde <laughs> microbrew and she really liked it. And we talked about that, but um, probably the pill, I would say, has been the hardest um the you know and then getting the uh the af days those weren't easy you know and the yeah and so i just want to clarify like as you adjusted to the pill in the beginning did your side effects go away or did they stay with you they did go away but it's now that you haven't taken it in so long it might okay yep yeah they went away um totally away like i could pop a pill uh without anything on board Oh, fine. And that was like for quite a while, like uh, probably a year and a half where it came okay. all. Uh, but now because I've been away from it so long, it'd be like starting over, um, yeah. which isn't a bad thing. Like I was, I literally did do this. I went to a concert um, in March and I started taking it uh, up before the concert. And what's funny was I had my pill ready and I, I you know, tirade it up and um None of us felt like drinking. <laughs> oh, <So> no. <laughs> my sister came over. That was the champagne that, you know, I bought it for that. Came over and um, I'm like, okay, you know, you know, I was talking to her about it before, you know, I'm getting ready to take my pill. And she's like, uh, Bren, I don't feel like it. And I'm go, I go, honestly, I don't either. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so funny. <laughs> so we never, she didn't drink. And obviously I didn't drink. And so, um, yeah, I'd have to tirade up and at the titrate up. And I don't think that that's some, that that's giving too much the thought to alcohol. Yeah. You're like, I'll just have a soda water, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, like just soda water and you know, I would rather have something really rewarding like a piece of chocolate or 
uh, maybe a nice steak, uh, you know, something really special that way. And alcohol is not even close to being special enough. A hot fudge sundae. Um, yeah. There's just been so many nuances, so many things uh, that, you know, feeding my birds have given me so much joy or the squirrel. Um, even just getting outside of myself and talking to other people. Yeah. And, there's been so many cool things that have that have you know come along the way without you know alcohol has no room there's no room for it like what, yeah. what is it there is no room yeah yeah I always remember and I felt the same way and I, I don't know if it was Claudia said in her documentary or somewhere but she was like filming something I think and she had to drink a beer for it and she did took her naltrexone drank the beer and there were french fries and she said she was more interested in the french fries than the beer like she didn't care about the beer and I was like yes it's the same like I preferred coconut water yeah I'd rather use those calories and have a delicious like ice cream and I'm like alcohol man <laughs> I'm good yeah, it's such an incredible feeling uh, yeah waste the calories it's like yeah. I'm waste my I waste my calories on something else that's really going to give me, you know, satisfaction. You yeah. know? And, and that's, and I reward myself. I still do, you know, not, but in the beginning, I think you really have to reward yourself. Like, okay, I'm not going to drink today. So, you know, and, and, and then you're feeling flat if you're taking out tracks on all the time. You're, you're not really getting that joyness in life. I, I don't think. I didn't, I should say, for, talk for myself. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I felt pretty flat. And so the days that I didn't drink, it was a reward. Um, I did other things too. Um, I would go for long drives. Um, I would play games. I mean, there was other things. Um, you know, I was trying to get some endorphins and I hurt my, my I got a, a problem with, a physical problem with my hand right now. So I can't do some things. But um, just anything to get those endorphins up and the ice cream, taco time. I mean, those things were the best I could do in the beginning. Yeah. And that reward. So I didn't feel like I was missing out like, oh, you know, but it was agonizing in the beginning. Like, what the heck am I going to do? What am I going to do? I got to drink and I don't want to drink anymore. Um, and it was just that mind thing. It was learned conditioning, you know. Yeah lost dog you ring the bell you drink and get off work reward you know I worked a hard day I put in you know and I'm a good worker and now it's my time it's Miller time you know it's time for me nobody yeah. can tell me I'm drinking <laughs> I'm going to Taco Bell <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know and Taco Bell once in a while but Taco Time is my favorite which yeah. is not like I'm a total junk food but I'm not I'm very actually really healthy <laughs> But those are my rewards is, you know, I have to have something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I think honestly, like, I think I've talked about that ad nauseum um, because I, I feel like for me as well, the way I got alcohol free days on TSM and made progress was through that system of rewards because alcohol was my go to reward for so long. And I felt like I was missing out if I didn't have something in place. So I would always institute a reward. If I was going to delay my drinking that day, or if I was going to go for an alcohol free day, I had to have a reward in place. Otherwise I couldn't do it. And yeah, same thing. It would be an ice cream or me. A, there's a great cheeseburger milkshake and fries in town at this place. And on Fridays, that's what I started doing. Cause I'd made a lot of progress on TSN, but I couldn't let go of like a night or a Friday night, like over drinking session and I was like ah, I don't want to do this every Friday anymore so I remember my first time going out and getting that cheeseburger milkshake and fries and I said if I want to drink after this I will but I'm just going to try this first and that was satisfying I didn't want to drink after that so that became my new reward on Fridays to kind of get those alcohol free days but I I agree we need that system of rewards but like you said it's, it's kind of agonizing you have to think up these things what am I going to do you have to try different things because if ice cream isn't that fun then you've got to figure out something Something else and so it takes that conscious effort and I think when we've been in that established habit of drinking like we have for years or decades it's so easy to, to default back into those familiar comfortable patterns even though they're not serving us anymore it's what's familiar and you know as humans we all like what's familiar so that's why I have such compassion and empathy for people that are stuck in those habits because it's not 
easy to get out of it. It takes thoughtfulness and planning and consistency and intentionality. But in my experience with naltrexone, when we can do it and especially just get going and do it a few times and see ourselves succeed with it, it, it gets easier and easier. Absolutely. It's hard to get the ball rolling. Um, one thing I, I learned a long time ago, or a phrase, I should say, I have a lot of cliches. I know a ton, but obviously for reasons why, but um, is it takes courage to not drink. Anyone can pick up a drink. Um, and it took courage. You know, I know it sounds not like really it took courage. And I know it did. It took a lot of courage to not pick up the drink and to do opposite uh, action. I did something completely opposite, even though it was very small, but that was winning. That was, that was absolutely winning, doing it differently. Yeah. And they were small things, nothing big. I never did anything that big. Yeah. And the tricky thing I found, I read a lot of Brené Brown when I was on TSM and she talks a lot about this stuff. You've probably read her too. And it's like alcohol, I think, strips away at our courage. So we're kind of starting without like a bank of courage. And it also requires vulnerability. And for us to be vulnerable with something that we've had so much shame and guilt around, like we have to really acknowledge, I think, the emotional state that we're in when we're, we start TSM and the damage that has been done and meet ourselves where we're at because I, I just did a poll recently in our community and asking uh do you feel that um excessive drinking impacted your self-worth and self-confidence and i think like 99 percent of people said yes and so it's just like recognizing that we're in a lower place when we start the method and in order to make these changes you're spot on we have to be courageous and it's difficult to start that out if you don't have a bank of courage or like these lived experiences with it but like you said you get the ball rolling and it gets easier the more you do it it really does um it's it's just taking that first step which is the hardest mm -hmm. it was so hard for me i mean i literally was just like what the heck am i gonna do i was so filled with all this angst of like, how am I going to survive this? Like it was, you know, it was that, I remember telling my sister that she's like, really, Brad, what are you going to do? You don't even know what to do. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to do. You know, here I'm almost 56 years old and I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. He's like, but that was the best I could do at that moment. It, that was the best I could do. And taco time was, you know, the second best thing I could do. And, and, you know, little by slow, oh my gosh, um, it's part of my story, which is, you know, everyone has one. And it's so cool that we get to share that. That's what this Thrive community and all of us together is that we can, we can help one another, which is everything. We need humans. I mean, that's, the, the the thing is, is with alcohol, I drink, this is my bar right here, right here is my bar. I never went out. I didn't go to bar. I didn't do any of that. So, you know, the loneliness, like I'd just be sitting here, if I wasn't talking to you, you know, four years ago, sitting here drinking. Um, so we don't want to be alone anymore. We don't, you know, we don't need to be alone anymore. We have people, community, the meetings, you know, people, I, I'm always asking people, please, you know, get involved in the meetings. They make a big difference. Be a part. You know, if you're shy, just leave your camera off. Um, don't, you know, put listening. You don't have to respond. When it took me months to finally, years ago, it took me months to to say hi. I'm, you know, I almost sound like AA. <laughs> but it, it took me a long time to just, someone kept asking me if I'd like to talk. And I never said anything. And then one day I was like, I, I got, you know, I, I need to talk. I need to, I need to be a part of this because, um, I was too afraid and shame all my drinking and just, I was so beaten down that I didn't think anyone would even want to hear me. And, um, that is, that's where I was so wrong. You know, like it, that's what al alcohol lying, that's what it does to you. It robs you of your self-worth and, you just feel like there's, you know, and you think, how could it possibly get better when you feel so down? It, does, it just keeps getting better. I mean, I, I, I cannot tell you my clarity of thought is just, it's amazing how much I, I'm like, wow, I had intuitive thought and I figured it out. Mm -hmm. 
I just before she just baffled me. Like, how in the heck um, am I, I? I don't. I can't figure it out. I don't know. I'm upset. I can't. You know, all these things. And now it's just like, wow, this calmness, you know, that I have. That alcohol, it was always revved up a little because I was hungover. You know, I feel. I mean, you walk around half your life feeling like crap, like you're just almost wanting to die and waiting for the next drink. You're not living in the moment, and you're not feeling very good physically feeling horrible in the mornings I would swear I'll never drink I don't want to drink I'm not going to drink today I would throw booze away I would take it to the rest stop dump it out I would give it to the homeless I, I did all kinds of things and then by that night drinking again because I felt just well enough to start drinking again where in the morning I felt so horrible I said that was the last thing on my mind was drinking and you know nine hours later I'm I'm back to drinking Oh my gosh. Yes. Those mornings are so rough and it's, it almost cuts at our, or gets to our shame cycle more because we're out of integrity with these things we're committing to ourselves. And I, I know that's how I felt. It's like every morning I'm like, I'm not going to drink tonight. Like, why do I keep doing this? And just like you, it's like four or five o'clock. Well, I can have a couple drinks tonight and the cycle would just continue. And I was hating that I couldn't follow through. Even just one alcohol free day was like, torture and difficult and I remember just thinking does everyone feel this way or is this just me and I would see my husband like he would easily go days and days or a week without drinking and I'm like how do you do that and make it look so effortless um now I know it's because he didn't have the alcohol use disorder that I had but it's yeah your mind is so preoccupied and um yeah it's it's dreadful to be living in that and as soon as you get a glimpse out and get that hope of tsm it's like oh my gosh this is possible oh my gosh like it's really really encouraging even i know one of our members has been posting recently he's brand new to tsm but he's seeing that light of like what life can look like when this isn't an issue and he's still drinking quite a bit but he can see it and he has that hope which is like such a beautiful thing like to have hope after being hopeless for so long it's the best feeling in the world it absolutely is and um and it goes it's not linear you know like it, it didn't work that way it was up and down um and you know i think the first year it's for the fir first year uh is for your body you know like just trying to get the pill in and get you know if, if we want to talk about a time frame um just get the medication in and get used to drinking on it and then not drinking and reducing and waiting and delaying and and i and that's where i kind of feel like to, for me it's like this year is for my mind like i, I i'm taking care of my body and I, i'm not you know craving alcohol anymore um it's just it takes some people so long and that, I don't know if it has anything to do with, you know, all the amounts that was long we've been drinking, um, you know, how many times we quit, stop like me, you know, that was a, a lot of that um, quitting, stopping, quitting, stopping, and uh, quitting, stopping, quitting, stopping, and then drinking, and yeah. then over and over, um, that we want it right now, because we've been through the trenches, you know, and like, it's time that I get this, and I get it now, and I, I got it, I got to get um cured right away it just takes so long for your mind the aud mind to rewire itself yeah and so i am always asking people you know just be patient you know it, it's gonna it's gonna come be patient and always take your medication i that's the one thing i was i knew in the beginning that was the that was i would never go without i i was always compliant mm -hmm that I think I've maybe once or twice forgot I'd taken it or taken two, you know, it was kind of like that thing, like, oh, I think I take it, I take it every day. So I'm sure I took it, but I don't know. So I think I had a couple of those, you know, the, the two years that I was really actively drinking. Um, but I heard Bruce loud and clear. My first time I heard him, he said, always, 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 always take your pill. And he said another thing that I, I try to leave with every single person. It's not your fault. You didn't ask to have AUD. None of us want this. We didn't ask to have it. And the first time I heard him say that, I'm a bit of a ball bag. I start crying because I've been so beat up. You know, my morals were off. I was a bad person. You know, why couldn't I just quit? And um, 
and to hear that. Um, so those are two things I always leave with people and the two things that um, the, the always take your medication and you'll, you'll, it'll turn out, it'll work. Yeah. That's so beautiful, Brenda. That's like, yeah. I, I love when Bruce says that as well. It just takes the load off of like, it's not your fault. It's like, oh, wow. Like, okay, I can actually catch my breath and like understand, okay, let me, you know, understand what's going on in my brain and understand how my brain just did what it's supposed to do by learning this alcohol use disorder and TSM kind of work to undo it. But you're right. There is, we have to be patient. And I think it's, I see as a coach, just people feeling, um, discouraged sometimes when they can't compare themselves to others because I know people who've gotten there in three months I think I was an average case like nine months to a year and then there's people like you it's like two years or we have someone in our program three years in but her drinking is down like more than 50 percent she's like having alcohol free days but she's just not quite where she wants to be yet um but the the improvements are just substantial and life-changing but it's a process and everyone is different and we come to the treatment with different stories and baggage and challenges and all of that so um yeah. and some people may be wanting um just harm reduction yeah and i don't see anything wrong with that i mean no traxone's dirty i mean it's cheap dirt cheap um if that's the way you want to live your life hey if you're doing better who's to say that, that there's nothing wrong with that you know if, if your life is going good you go to work and you pay your bills and your spouse is happy why not you know right. yeah I hope someday we'll see young kids just, and I always love it when I have a welcome call with a younger, I love it when I have a welcome call with anyone, but uh, the young folks that, you know, haven't been through the hell that most of us have, uh, I am just, I cannot, I, I just love that because I think someday maybe the younger generation will be like, hey, I got my pill, you got your pill, let's go, let's, we're going out, you know, and it, it won't be this, like, everyone will know. Like, yeah. bring your pill and take your pill, or I don't know, maybe we'll evolve so much that we won't even have alcohol. I don't know what will happen in the future, but I, I know that there's a solution, and the younger folks are finding it. And yeah. They see, they see their uncle, their aunt, their mom, their whoever that's had this long history of AUD and all the, the wreckage. And then they're seeing, wow, I'm kind of liking the way I'm feeling, and I'm blacking out or browning out. I got to nip this in the bud. Yeah. How intelligent. I mean, I'm not, I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's the work of Claudia, you, Karen, Bruce, Smart. I mean, all of you, every one of you, I mean, we're making a difference. And um, I, just, I just love that. I hope to see billboards of it someday. Yeah, me too. Me too. I want it to be the frontline treatment. And I know we're all, everyone watching, including you too, Brenda, like we're all spreading the word one person at a time. And I just trust that there will be a tipping point at some point. Me too. Um, well, I want to wrap up with just letting everyone know that um, in the description below, I will put um, information because Brenda is now a Sinclair Method coach through YourSinclairMethod.com, which is the coaching page for C3 Foundation. Um, so I've, I'm, link, I'm linking her page below if someone would like to book a one-on-one -on -one session with her. Um, she's also very active and involved with Thrive as well. She's always, um, or she's takes welcome calls a lot for people who join because everyone who joins gets a welcome call. And I know you're very involved in the community piece. You host meetings and things in there as well. So um, for our Thrive members who are watching or if you want to join Thrive, Brenda's um, also very active in there. Um, Brenda, anything else you wanted to add and share um, just for people to think about who are watching this on TSM, wherever they're at? Like what final words do you want to leave us with today? Oh, if there's one, be gentle with yourself, be kind to yourself. If beating yourself up would do it, then we've already would have done it. Um, <laughs> let's try something different, folks. Let's try and try and be kind, you know. Um, that is so, so important. That's, that's the, the if anything, yeah, yourself. 
I think that's great advice because I think when we suffer with alcohol use disorder, we are the first ones to beat ourselves up. I know for me, it was like on autopilot. I just did it <laughs> unconsciously and all the time. I was like, oh, I'm really mean to myself and in my mind. Um, so yeah, being kind to yourself. And I think when we can do that more and more, we learn to respect ourselves more. And when we respect ourselves, often we want to be less self-destructive and you know drink less excessively. So um, really great advice. Thank you so much, Brenda. Is there anything else you wanted to say or share before we wrap up for today? Um, I can't, I'm just, I can't thank uh, Dr. Sinclair enough for this medication. It saved my life. I have no doubt. I don't think I would have been here with mm -hmm. that um, seizure type thing I had, or well, the only one, hopefully. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful very grateful to be here. Yeah. And I'm so grateful to you for sharing your story with us. I know this is going to reach a lot of people. So thank you for coming on to, to share. And I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Katie. Thanks. Bye. Much.